My talk is going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to have as many slides. I decided to try to make my talk as accessible as possible. If there were blind or deaf people in the audience, then we would accommodate them. So I'm with uh, Cheryl Burksteller, my co-PI and director. She's somewhere in the room today. So during my talk, you'll see some pauses. And that's for people to read the slides if they're deaf. And also, I will show, I'll, I'll describe all the pictures that I show. So the goal is to increase the participation and success of students with disabilities in the community. And here there are some pictures. On the left are two computer science students uh, blind who are at a computer. In the middle is a deaf student who's learning Scratch at one of my workshops. And on the right is a student who has a severe motor disability is using a special device. Why do we need access computing? 15% of working age people had a disability, but only 1% did PhDs. I was proud to give this young man, Sean Kane, his hoodie at his hoodie ceremony for a PhD at the University of Washington, me and Jake Bobart. So we really need more, more people like Sean. He's a very successful <coughs> researcher now at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. People with disabilities contribute. So here are five pictures of uh, Chenko Asakawa, who's blind. She's the director of accessibility research at IBM Tokyo Research Lab. And uh, there's Jimmy Cook, who's a professor at New Mexico State. She's in a wheelchair. There's uh, Jonathan Kumahon, who is uh, an Iraq War veteran who's lost an arm. There's been Cerf, the president of the ACM, who invented the internet, I think, or is called the father of the internet. And there is Stephen Hawking, who is one of the most famous physicists of the day. Of course, we can't do this alone. We have 33 partners. Some of them are institutional partners, universities, and some of them are organizational partners. And all of these partners agree with us with our, that there should be more people with disabilities so we have two strategies, direct interventions. Here you can see with a group of blind students at the National Federation of the Blind teaching computer science and uh, computer science and product activities. And institutional change, this is, this is an institutional building for the university. Uh, so these are our two main strategies. Direct interventions, a little bit more about that. So for direct interventions, we, we give up many grants to other organizations. Some of them are our partners, and they do direct interventions. And we gather data. <coughs> um, we also have uh, uh, internships. I think we have over 270 internships in the last couple of years. Here are four pictures of students in different workshops uh, at National Technical Institute for the Deaf at the University of Washington. And this young lady on the right, at the bottom, is, is deaf, hard of hearing, excuse me, she's deaf, and she also has cerebral palsy, so that was an interesting challenge. Institutional change. So, we do a lot of things for institutional change. In fact, most of our activities are in institutional change. Uh, we have capacity building institutes, we have 20 of those. Um, we have a knowledge base with more than 350 articles that we've created in the last seven years. That's an example on the right. On the right. Um, we have six communities of practice with 380 members, and we have about 40, we work with 40 departments on the web pages. On the lower left is one of our capacity building institutes. Those are the people that come together uh, from a variety of <coughs> backgrounds and share ideas and come together. And here's a person who's going to receive an award, Mark Bomba, will get that award tomorrow. And up in the upper left, oops, I don't get to that. So we have some outcomes. More people with disabilities in computing fields and more computing innovation because of their expertise and perspectives. There's no numbers here. It's just that this is the world.